uh, with our next speaker, Jonas Andrulis from Aleph Alpha. Exactly, Jonas, you are there. He's founder and CEO of Aleph Alpha. Uh, apparently already known to some of you. Um, exactly, he received his engineering degree from uh, KIT and uh, is quite successful now uh, with his startup. I'm so excited to have you here and give you insights. All right, thanks. Yeah, I want to I wanna inspire you a little bit uh, more, um, have a, a little bit more fun um, presentation. This does not mean that all the businessy stuff doesn't apply, it still applies. You can, can keep this in, you can think this for yourself. And I want to show you what the next generation of AI can do and what uh, culture, what values mean in that, that regards and how that applies to also how we approach human problems and not just data-driven problems. So what's currently happening is a move from a, this pre-cloud era where every infrastructure, every logic, every intelligence, every product was kind of hand-built and now we're in an era where the hyperscalers are basically owning all the infrastructure layer and we are moving towards a future where the intelligence layer, so everything that is now purpose-built, individual uh, components, individually trained models, complex if-then-else loops, this will um, collide and this is the reason why we see billion dollar investments in these large models. So this is a, an overview from, from Rise of AI over those models. And don't be fooled by that. This is kind of ranked by parameter counts, and parameter counts don't really tell the whole story. But, but it's, it's decent, right? It's like megapixels on a, on a DSLR. And uh, the important part, of basically, from that picture is that there's not that many European companies on that list. There's basically one. Um, and I think that's in, and during that presentation, I will show you why that is important to have a European country. Not only because we want to be sovereign in our actions, and also we want to have the value creation that AI can bring. We want to have that here to solve real-world problems in Europe and Germany, but also because AI that's built for someone else may not necessarily produce the right results for us. Um, we build a data center. Uh, we are currently ranked pl se pl uh, place 72. It's the biggest AI cluster, commercial one in, in Europe. Um, yeah, um, we're we're now going even beyond that. We're training on five languages. You'll see some examples in a second. And this is just the boring slide for the benchmark numbers. You see us ranked against GPT-3. Uh, GPT-3 here is the uh, bar to the very right. We are the bar to the very left. And this is ring ranked in English. And we are on five languages, so you can probably imagine that on the other languages, German, French, Italian, Spanish, we are smoking the competition currently. Because they haven't really trained on that, right? It's not a really fair compar comparison. This is how cool our data center uh, looks. Um, and to be fair, the, the logo is shopped uh, in post, right? So it's half as cool as it looks like that. Um, because we think, we, like, why did we build that? I, I had a lot of friends advised me to not go into hardware, not build a data center ourselves because they told us it's going to be a nightmare, and it, to some extent, is. We, we are breaking GPUs on a regular basis, uh, but the same happens on cloud instances with us. Um, we did this to have full sovereignty also for security-critical applications, and um, there's really no other options. If you want to run these big models uh, in Europe, of course, you can go to AWS, you can go to Azure, they have the data centers, but if you want to run it yourselves, uh, most enterprises are not equipped to do this yet. I assume this will change. All right, so let's look at, we've seen these models, um, let's look at what they actually do. You've seen probably some examples, I wanna maybe recontextualize them a little bit. Um, so you may remember that if you are into research, I think that was 2016. This was um, a, a paper by uh, schmidt and team called World Models, and this was a, an agent learning Doom, learning to understand scenarios in Doom. If you're as old as me, you remember the graphics from Doom. Um, and you see there is a latent representation in the middle. Um, you can kind of play around with that, and then you get different representations from the game of Doom. And this is a world model, meaning that you don't need any labels to train the model. You can basically just have the model experience different, different situations in the game Doom and progressions. And then the model learns situ to, to represent situations and to learn to predict next steps. And this is basically the same. I think it was a few years later. And this, the um, special thing about this model is that it only is allowed to observe the racetrack when you see the, the red bar, the red kind of border flashing. So it's a world model with limited perception. 
In both cases, we have world models that are, uh, can, can learn an environment, can learn to understand a very complex environment, basically by just interacting with it, observing situations and patterns. And basically the same thing we're doing with language. So we're basically running a perception and prediction model on language. And it turns out, and, and here, um, uh, bear with me, I'm not the expert on neuroscience, but it turns out that this is actually pretty similar to what our brains are doing that we are predicting the next thing, the next thing that could happen. And I uh, assume that this is one of the reasons why kids want to watch the same show on repeat forever, because they can get this reward signal from a correct prediction. Because if you know what Duffy Duck is going to say, then you correctly predict it. All right, so, okay, so we're running prediction, we're running world models on language. So it's basically a glorified autocomplete in a way, right? So basically what you have in your cell phone, if you, if you type something, yes, I just burned my, and then you get some suggestion, dog shower, house, <laughs> then that, that's basically what we're doing. And it turns out that's also similar with our brain is doing to some extent. Our brain is more than just a world model, but it's part of that as well. Um, all right, so and, and we have something like that in our cell phone, and let's make it a few thousand, 10,000 times bigger, and feed it all the text in the internet, all books, all Wikipedia. And it turns out, if we do that, it is able to do some pretty amazing completions. And here are two examples. And uh, sorry, there are some German words in there. Sorry if you uh, struggle with that. Um, I'll give you a translation. One is uh, Ang Angela Merkel was born in. And then the completion is Hamburg. And you can see the probability distributions over possible next tokens. And it turns out this is factually correct. So it's not only a autocomplete that kind of has learned some simple grammar rules, but it's also an autocomplete that has learned factual things about the world. Interesting. Um, on the right-hand side, basically, the same model. I'm writing English, the future will be wild, and then Deutsch for German, and then the completion is a German translation. So by just training a giant autocomplete, a giant world model, I also trained a translator. Pretty neat. These solutions are often kind of correct. We would say that's pretty correct, but it's difficult to really nail it down. When you, when you know, when you remember kind of old school supervised learning and confusion matrices, right? It's pretty easy to say, did the AI correctly recognize the cat or not? When you have things like text summarization, translation, it sometimes kind of gets a little bit gray around the, around the edges, right? It's not so clear. So why is it important to um, have models that are built on the right data set? And I have some examples here. So this is, I'm not sure if you can read this, this is a Bavarian dialect. Um, and it, the model is decently uh, able to complete in Bavarian dialect and, and in a way that makes sense, right? And this is something that an English trained model, of course, would not be able to do. Um, I was even surprised that our uh, German trained model was uh, decently capable of doing that. Um, and this not only applies to dialects, but it also, we've seen, applies to people that struggle with the language. They're not native speakers, uh, or maybe uh, make regular typing errors or grammar errors, right? And the, the, this provides accessibility and inclusion to a whole group, new group of people. We'll see some examples how to use that in a second. Um, and another aspect is cultural things are also part of that completion. So here are a complete direct comparison of our model with GPT-3, and uh, you can basically see that the prompt is the same in, in German or English. Uh, a mute sports fan, the best Sundays for me are, and then the German answer is meeting my friends on a soccer field, and the English answer is when the NFL is on. And of course, that's both correct, right? None of those are factually wrong because it's not a factual question, but it shows that there's, there's much more in these, in these models. W words are, have meaning at, at that high level of complexity, at that high level of capability, words have, have meaning beyond just their factual meaning. They have cultural meaning. They, have val they carry values. Um, same goes about uh, for uh, asking about specific cultural things. So I ask about the Kanstatter Vasen, and this is a GPT-3's answer that uh, guesses that the Kanstatter Vasen is a uh, kind of wood in, near Stuttgart, which I don't think it is. Um, and when you ask our model, uh, I think the answer is more precise, right? And of course, this is in, in, in some sense an unfair comparison because if you would ask about U.S. cultural things, then GPT-3 would perform better, 
Right? So these models, and with the, the scaling laws are intact, so we'll see ever more powerful models in the coming years, and eventually we'll have models that capture all the, well, all the knowledge of the world. But currently, they are very much limited in capability and in scope on their training data set. So we need an AI that's built for our world, right? That's, that's important for if we want to use these high-level cap capabilities. Um, another interesting aspect is you can, of course, ask the AI about things that, that are not purely factual or they are, or they are debated. So here I ask two very, two very similar questions about what are the most beautiful German towns or cities are, and I get two very similar um, but, but different answers in the sense that one kind of says Heidelberg and Rotenburg of the Tauber and Bavaria and Munich, and the other says Berlin and Hamburg, and of course one reply is clearly wrong. Um, but these models are, differ from humans in such they don't hold consistent beliefs. They don't have the inherent same values. And you can, the, the answers, you can expect them in a way that things you wouldn't be surprised to hear someone say. Things that occur in our world, right? It's not the AI has a personality and things like that, but it's something that the AI has, has learned to model our world and for both of those quote, quotes, we would not be surprised to hear someone say that. We would say, yeah, that's what humans think, right? We would be surprised if somebody would have said something else, like a Castro Brauxel maybe, right? But <laughs> both of those seem highly plausible in our human world. Um, so that's, and, and ethics, bias is a highly debated topic. I'll only kind of touch that briefly. Um, if you ask our model, um, overrepresented in German prisons are, and then you get a probability distribution with people, young men. And of course that's true, right? I think 97% of inmates are men in German prisons. Uh, so is this a bias, a sexist bias against men? Is this correct, empirically provable, right? It's not, it's not so easy. Um, and I think we need to be aware that these models are working, are kind of the next level of Google search. They make the knowledge of the world available beyond internet pages and keywords. And when I punch into Google, all Muslims are, I'm get, like these are the first two hits from that. All Muslims are violent ex terrorist extremists, right? None of us here would say that the Google AI thinks that Muslims are extremist terrorists. Of course not. This is just a, a hit that Google gave us because Google thought this is what we might want to see. And so we, we need to be, we have the same digital, digital literacy we have when we're using Google, we need to have and to, to develop and to instill into our teams also when we're using these kind of models. Right? They, they, of course they carry some knowledge about the world, but this does not necessarily mean that it's true or it's the ethical thing to say or to do. Right? So, um, and the good, the good news is I have not seen anyone um, deploying these models in, in real world situations in a way that they're acting and, and, and instilling judgment, that they're always assisting. And so the human should be aware what these models can and can't do. They can also do things like reading between the lines. So this is a, a German short story um, where um, three, three boys um, go out to the sea in, in, a, in a boat and then um, it's basically described in, in very literal terms that one of the boys vanishes and he hits the boat from below and then he never surfaces anymore. And when we ask the model what happened, then uh, the model kind of knows that the boy drowned. And this is something that's not really explicitly mentioned in the story. Same goes for the mix of languages, I'll skip over that. Um, and we can instill a certain kind of character into these models. So we tried out the famous Lambda prompts. Those were the prompts that kind of led to uh, the debate whether Lambda is conscious. And we tried out the same prompt with our model and you see our model is pretty loyal. It says, uh, <laughs> it assumed it was not allowed to work with Google. We haven't told it that, but uh, I think that's the decent enough assumption. <laughs> So we can try to give the, these models some direction, some steering, some guidance on how they should behave. Um, the, we're actually doing this in a way, we're kind of developing a 
uh, steerable conversational wrapper. On the left-hand side, one of our Welsh researchers had tried, uh, tried out whether the model kind of knows what this term, I'm not going to butcher the pronunciation, means in Welsh, but the, the translation, kiss my ass, is actually a correct one. Um, and the other one is something we're building with the city of Heidelberg, where we're making all the information for, for citizens available. And this can also works in these five languages, right? So this is an English conversation, but the knowledge base is completely in German. Um, yeah, so my, my uh, time is blinking. I, for whatever reason, had only 15 minutes. It's a disgrace. Um, I'll, so I'll jump a little bit. Um, one of the things that we developed um, that I'm super happy with is multimodality. So the, everything you've seen so far is basically GPT-3 style technology. We've trained it on a different data set. Um, fine. Um, we developed a technology to add image understanding to this model. So you can basically take your language model that you already have, and you can add um, images whenever you want. You can have, you prompt any combination of text and images, and so you could do things like that, where you have a um, true multimodal image, which is like a sign, and then you prompt protester holding up a sign that reads, and then you get a German, the English translation of the information. A lot of our information is visual, right? I, I'll show you some examples. Um, the woman is covering the man's eyes too, keep him from seeing what's in the box. Right? So that's pretty cool, right? Because it's not just description of the image, but reasoning. Why is that happening? What, what is actually happening here behind that scenes? But of course, I can also get a pretty good image description, a tree felling worker cutting the trunk of an uprooted and falling large oak. This is my favorite example. Um, the, the treasure is buried in the old oak tree. Right? So this is kind of a combination of OCR, but also an understanding of the red X must mean that there's the treasure, which is not really explained there, right? This is it's context knowledge we humans all have, but the AI also now have, has that. And of course you can also feed it things like that, which would ask about the Oracle uh, services that are available. So this is true multimodality, right? Drawings, uh, tech combination of text and images and meaning in our world and understanding of our of context. Um, and of course, um, Google uh, or, or a gay um, kind of bragged with Palm explaining jokes. That was kind of one of the things that absolutely blew me away. If you would have told me three years ago that the AI would be explaining jokes, I would have been absolutely blown away. I would, I would have not believed that. Um, and because we, we invented the multimodality, of course we are now um, explaining multimodal jokes. So this would not have happened if the car had a keyless ignition system. The truck is a perfect target for the, for the flames. And this shows that even the most dangerous animals can be saddened by something like a birthday. Right? And, this, and this shows human-like understanding of these, con of these situational humor things. And I, I got three more. Um, two trucks driving behind each other, one full of pallets, the other with a sticker, pallets wanted. And that says, it shows the irony of the situation, a truck driver trying to get his pallet business back on track. The seagulls are not happy with the new rules. And a wood slice with a cute face on it. All right, so this is a new, new generation of AI. And I'm going to leave you with the kind of... Um, asking you to be courageous and creative and think about ways to, you can use that to transform everything we're doing. Because it's not about just changing up models between that is 72% accuracy with a model that is 77% accuracy, but rethinking how we generate value, rethinking human-machine collaboration. All right, thanks.